Meanwhile, Dionysus's steward Phocus, when he saw a warship, felt certain a certain alarm. Ingratiating himself with one of the crew, he found out from him who they really were and where they were from and the reason for their journey. So he realized that this tyranny brought real disaster for Dionysius and that he would not live if he were separated from Calerho. He was fond of his master and wanted to forestall trouble and extinguish a war that would not be a big affair, certainly not widespread, but affected Dionysius' household alone. So he rode off to a Persian garrison and told them that an enemy Tyremi was riding at anchor in a secluded spot, perhaps with a view to spying, perhaps for piracy, and that it was in the king's interest that it be seized before it did any harm. He convinced the Persians and led them out in battle order. So they fell on the ship in the middle of the night, set it on fire, and destroyed it. They chained all the men they took alive and drove them back to the garrison. When the prisoners were shared out, Chariots and Polycarmus begged to be sold to one master. The man who got them sold them into Caria. There, trailing heavy chains, they worked the land of Mithridates. Charias appeared to Calerho in a dream, in chains, trying to approach her, but in unable to do so. She uttered in her sleep a loud, piercing cry of distress. Come to me, Charias! That was the first time Dionysus had heard the name of Charias. To his wife's consternation, he asked, Who is it you are calling to? Her tears gave her away. She could not hold her grief in check, but gave voice to her sorrow. A poor, unfortunate man, she said, my first husband. Unhappy even in my dreams, I saw him in chains. Oh, my poor husband, in looking for me, you have found death. It is your death that the chains signify, while I am alive and living in luxury, lying on a bed of beaten gold with another husband. But before long I shall come to you. Even in life, even if in life we could not enjoy each other, we shall possess each other in death. When he heard this, Dionysius was assailed by conflicting sentiments. He was seized with jealousy that Calerho loved Charius even dead with fear that she would kill herself, yet still he was heartened by the thought that his wife thought her first husband dead, for he supposed that she would leave Dionysius if Charius was no longer alive. So he consoled his wife as best he could, and for many days he watched over her in case she did herself some harm. Calero's grief was dissipated by the hope that perhaps Charius was alive, and her dream had been a deceptive one, and most of all, by the child in her womb. Seven months after the wedding, she gave birth to a son, ostensibly Dionysius' child, but in reality, that of Charius. The town mourn mounted a great festival, and delegations came from all over as people shared in Miletus' happiness at the addition to Dionysius' family. The master, in his joy, yielded to his wife in everything, and made her a mistress of his house. He filled the temples with votive gifts, and invited the whole town to sacrificial banquets. Calerho was worried that her secret would be betrayed, so she asked for Planjon to be freed. Planjon was the only person besides herself who knew she was pregnant when she came to Dionysius, and Calerho wanted to make sure of having her loyalty, not just as a matter of sentiment, but on the basis of her material position. I will gladly recognize the help that Planjun has given us in our courtship, said Dionysius, but we are acting wrongly if, when we reward the servant, we are not to show gratitude to Aphrodite, in whose temple we first saw each other. I want to more than you do, said Calerho, since my debt to her is greater than yours. 
for the moment, I am still recovering from the birth. It will be safer if we wait a few days before we go to the country. She quickly recovered from the birth and grew stronger and bigger, no longer a girl, but now a mature woman. When they reached the estate, Focus arranged magnificent sacrifices. A large crowd had followed them from town. As he began the public offerings, Dionysus said, Lady Aphrodite, you are the source of all my blessings. It is you who gave me Calerho, and you who gave me my son. You have made me a husband and a father. I was satisfied to have Calerho. She is sweeter to me than count country or parents. But I love my child for making his mother more surely mine. I have a guarantee of her goodwill. I beg you, my lady, keep Calerho safe for my sake, and keep my son safe for her sake. The crowd of people standing round said Amen to his prayer, and pelted them with roses or violets or whole garlands, so that the temple grounds were filled with flowers. Well, Dionysius had voiced his prayer in the hearing of everyone, but Calerho wanted to speak to Aphrodite alone. First, she took her son in her own arms. That formed a beautiful sight, such as no painter has ever yet painted, nor sculptor sculpted, nor poet recounted, since none of them has represented Artemis or Athena holding a baby in her arms. Dionysius wept for joy when he saw it, and quietly addressed a propitious propitiatory pair to Nemesis. Calerho told Plan John alone to stay with her and sent everyone else to the house. When they had left, she stood near to Aphrodite and held up her child. On his behalf I am grateful to you, mistress, she said. On my own behalf I am not sure. I should be grateful to you for or myself as well, if you had watched over Chereus for me. But you have given me an image of my dear husband. You have not taken Chereus from me altogether. Grant, I pray you, that my son be more fortunate than his parents, like his grandfather. May he too sail on a flagship, and when he is in action, may people say, Hermocrates' grandson is greater than he was. His grandfather, too, will be happy to see his courage inherited, and we shall be happy, his parents, even if we are dead. I beg you, mistress, be at peace with me now. I have had enough misfortune. I have died and come to life again. I have been taken by pirates and made an exile. I have been sold and been a slave, and I reckon my second marriage a greater burden yet than all this. I beg one favor of you, and of the other gods through you, to requite all. Preserve my fatherless child. She would have said more, but could not, for her tears.